Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the ESRF Colloquium. It's my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, today's speaker, uh, Xavier Vental from uh, CEA Grenoble. Uh, before uh, introducing Xavier and, uh, and today's talk uh, topic, uh, I'd like to make a few announcements. So uh, in uh, forthcoming October 28th, October, there will be a colloquium by Michele Parinello from Instituto Italiano de Tecnologia in uh, Genova uh, on molecular dynamics. And uh, also uh, earlier in October, there will be a quantum materials workshop at ESRF, and you can uh, get information on that at, on the ESRF webpage. Uh, also, for uh, the uh, numerous people who are uh, following this on uh, Zoom, uh, you are invited to use the question and answer box at the bottom of your uh, Zoom window to ask questions uh, to the speaker and uh, to upvote the questions you think uh, should be answered in priority uh, at the end of the talk. Um, uh, so, uh, now to today's speaker. Uh, Xavier Vental uh, studied at Ecole Polytechnique in Palaiso near Paris, and then uh, studied the theoretical physics at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, and uh, did his PhD at CEA, Commissariat à l'énergie atomique in Saclay, uh, and he received his PhD in 1999. Yes, uh, um, his uh, field of uh, uh, study and uh, research is uh, theoretical condensed matter physics. Uh, he's an expert in um, um, quantum physics of uh, nano devices, in particular quantum uh, transport phenomena in such uh, devices. Um, after his PhD, he went to Cornell University for two years and uh, came back to France in uh, uh, 2002, was hired as a scientist at CERA in Saclay, near Paris, and uh, then moved to CERA in Grenoble in uh, 2009. And um, the title of today's talk uh, is Computers, what are they? What are they supposed to do? Will they work? Uh, Xavier, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> so I said thank you. <laughs> and yes, we need to switch. So maybe while the... We, oh, okay, we, we got the screen already. You have best wishes from <laughs> Francesco who has joined online. Thanks. So what I want to do today is uh, an introduction to quantum computing. Uh, I mean, we hear about quantum computers everywhere now. And so the idea of this talk is uh, uh, to try and explain how they are supposed to work. And, and there are two ways I could have done that. I could have started from the bottom, which means the physics, explaining all the quantum physics, so different platforms we could use for quantum computing, and then climb up the ladder to more abstract things until we arrive to quantum algorithm on how they are supposed to change the, uh, the life as we, uh, as we know it. Um, and, and that would be the natural thing for me because I'm a physicist. I really come from the, the bottom part. Uh, I'm going to have only one slide on this. And then I will start from the exact opposite, from the top. As a mathematician, try to explain what they're supposed to be. And then we try to see what it means in practice for a quantum computer to do something useful. Uh, but I will keep my physicist mind ready, and I will try to show you what it would mean in practice for the hardware uh, for every single assumption that we make from the theoretical side. So that's really what I, I want to do today. I'm going to try to be as pedagogic as possible. The idea is to do something. It's a bit of a survey, so there, are, there is a lot of material. But nevertheless, I try to, to do something understandable so that you can come back home with at least uh, some understanding of, of what you're supposed to, to do, and then you will have a, an associated understanding of uh, what you might need for this to work. So this is my only physics slide. 
Uh, essentially, a quantum computer is made of qubits, and the qubit is a simply a two-level system for us physicists. So you, lab you label one state zero, zero state one. That's one qubit. If you have many qubits and you manage to control them, then you have a quantum computer. And, and since anything is quantum, you can do a quantum computer with pretty much everything that you, uh, that you know. So here I took a couple of pictures from the web. Uh, you can do it with photons. You can do it with germanium. You can do it with silicon. You can do it with cold ions, ultra cold ions. You can do it with Rydberg atoms, uh, with impurities. It's NV center in diamonds. Uh, and this is a superconducting circuit. Uh, I think this one is from IBM. But I mean, the list is much longer than that. These are just the most prominent platforms that you could use. And, and I, I would be happy to answer your questions about or at least some of them at the end, if you have some. Uh, but what I'm going to say today essentially applies to, to all of them. Uh, so quantum computing is big. This is what you can find on the web. Uh, this is a French quantum initiative. So it's in French, but it's, uh, uh, you see it's, uh, it's going to be a big bang. Uh, in five or 10 years, it's going to be, uh, we have going to have uh, quantum computers a billion times faster than uh, what we have right now. It's, you know, it's, it's a French uh, government site, you can find this. Uh, and what is interesting about this report is that if you read the, uh, the summary of what quantum computers will be, we do, uh, you have it, we're going to, to be, use them to, to be more healthy, to feed ourselves better, to fight climate change, to fight uh, natural catastrophe, to move better, to produce better, uh, and so on and so forth. And if you look at all these promises, essentially from a physicist's point of view, it's we are going to use quantum computers to solve what we call the many body problem. And that's natural, it will be the, the central, I mean, central part of what I'm going to explain today. A quantum computer is nothing but a quantum many body problem. Uh, that we control very well. So usually, quantum body problem here, I, I wrote the, the dummiest way you could write it, Schrodinger equation for the wave function of uh, the position of all the electrons, let's say, in a system. You can have uh, zillions of them. So it's a partial differential equation with a lot of dimension. So of course, it's extremely difficult to solve this, especially if you write it like that. Uh, on the quantum computer will be essentially the same, except that instead of the position of the electrons, we will have the value of the different qubits. That's what a quantum computer is for us. So before I really start, I want to, to stress that will be with the central point I'm going to make ever on, over and over uh, in this talk, that's the problem of decoherence. And, and let me formulate it a bit more precisely. Um, yes, sir. Ah, yes. I will try to use the mouse so that you can follow. Uh, yes, you can follow better. Um, so, uh, my first point is that the quantum computer is a digi is a is an analog machine. Sorry. So, by analog, I mean that the internal state of a quantum computer is a quantum state. I think I have it on the next slide. Here it is. So this is uh, uh, essentially, uh, you have a basis, I1, I2, I3, I n correspond to the value of the different qubits. So each of them can take zero and one. So the internal state of my quantum computer is a bunch of complex numbers. And the, the important point is that these complex numbers, they are continuous variables. They, they can vary continuously. And when I'm going to act on my quantum computer, when I'm going to send a, a voltage pulse or something like that, essentially what I'm going to do are rotations uh, of one along one axis or another of uh, this big vector. On, on any rotation uh, is going to be done. Let's say if I say rotate 20 degree left, it's okay, 20 degree plus or minus something. Maybe it's plus or minus one degree, maybe it's plus or minus 0 0.01 degree if I'm very good. But always, I'm going to lose a little bit of precision. Uh, and as opposed to if I have a, a classical state, just classical bit, plus one volt, minus one volt, then it's unambiguous. There are only two possibilities. And I don't lose precision along the way. That's really an important point. And that means uh, that the fidelity of my calculation, so you can take it as a loose sense of how good is my precision, or you can take the 
uh, mathematical definition essentially the projection of the state I got on the state I am supposed to get. This fidelity is going to decrease exponentially uh, as a number of gates that I apply. So a gate is an operation. Essentially, it's going to be a practice. It's a voltage pulse or it's a laser pulse or something like that. Uh, so small f is a, the fidelity per gate, and then it's going to decrease exponentially uh, as, as the calculation go on. Uh, this is for all analog machines. Uh, it's even worse for quantum computers uh, because first, uh, even when you do nothing, actually the fidelity goes down. That's called decoherence, especially because my, my quantum computer is going to get entangled with other degrees of freedom that are around, uh, other electromagnetic modes, some phonons, anything. And also because you cannot look before the end of the calculation. If you look in that you measure, you project your wave function, that's it, you have to start again. Uh, so you have to do everything blindly and measure at the very end. And uh, you probably have heard about uh, uh, an important experiment that happened two years ago. It was by Google. It was called quantum supremacy. It was over everywhere. I think even in Grenoble in the Dauphiné Libéré, which doesn't publish science so often. We, we had an article on quantum supremacy. Uh, so essentially what this, uh, I mean, okay, we, we, I will discuss the quantum supremacy aspect a bit at the end, but essentially what these people do, what these people did, sorry, is to, uh, uh, is to, to uh, check experimentally that the law that I wrote before, this is exponential decay of the fidelity, was actually correct. For large systems, they managed to have 53 qubits working together, a large depth, so number of operations, so essentially 20 layers where they apply gate between every pair of qubits. Uh, and you see a nice exponential decay here as a function of the number of qubits and as a function of the number of cycles, so this depth of the circuit. Uh, so it's experimentally confirmed. I mean, but it's not as if we had any doubt, but, but this was a very important uh, check that was done experimentally to see that we do have an understanding of how fast it decays. In this experiment, it's really uh, top notch, I would say at the moment. Typically, you lose 1% uh, of the fidelity every time you do something. A typical error rate today. So the central question of quantum computing is now it's easy to state it. We have an exponential decay uh, of the fidelity. On the other hand, we have an exponentially large Hilbert space, and we need this exponentially large Hilbert space if we want to have quantum speed up. I will explain that later. So the question is who, who is going to win? I mean, do, can we get to interesting part of the Hilbert space before we have lost all the information? That's really the key question that should be in everyone's minds. Um, I will make a distinction about three types of experiments. Uh, so, so the first type is what people call quantum simulations. Uh, quantum simulation, from my point of view, is essentially what we physicists have been doing forever, which means we take a system, supposingly that we know very well, and we uh, if if we if we are sure that the system is, is represented by a given model, then by looking at the system itself, maybe we can learn something about the solution of this mathematical model. And that's what people have been trying to do, for instance, with cold atoms, where they try to mimic Hubbard models or these kind of things. And, and the advantage is that since you want to learn about something that may have decoherence itself, the fact that the, your experiment has decoherence maybe is not so bad. And so I would say this is what we have been doing, and it's totally fine. And it's not yet what we call the, call the quantum computer, in the sense that it doesn't really do calculation. Yet. Then you have actual quantum computers, the one that we can find uh, now in the, in the lab, uh, essentially that are noisy. So they have a finite fidelity here, which are not so great at the moment, typically 1% for, uh, for the best qubits. And then you have a notion which are called fault-tolerant quantum computers, which means the perfect quantum computer. And so it's, you can either see it from a mathematical point of view, it's perfect, no noise, no decoherence, forget about this uh, fidelity thing. Or you can try to build it from noisy circuits if you introduce something which is called quantum error correction. And I will talk a little bit about that later too. Uh, but it, it, it has a very big overhead in the sense that if you want to, to do quantum error correction, you will be working with what people call logical qubits that are made out of many actual physical ones. And typically, the untry, untry uh, 
point uh, to do something useful is like a billion qubits, uh, while here it's more like a, it, it would be 50 if you had an ideal qubit. So, so it's a, there's a huge, uh, a huge entries cost on the endless list of bottlenecks. Okay, so I'm, I'm done now with uh, the generalities. Now I, I can start trying to explain you how it's supposed to work. Um, so if you open any, uh, uh, any uh, article on quantum computing, you will, you will see something like that. It looks like a, a music partition. Uh, each line corresponds to one qubit. And whenever you act on it, you put here uh, a small box with the name of the operation that you are trying to do. Okay, here I just use uh, generic names, but you could use uh, uh, more specific ones. If it acts on one qubit, it's just one box like this. If it acts on two qubits, it looks like that. And you read it like you would read music. And it mathematically, it just means that you apply these unitary operators on your initial states, which is just a state where you have prepared all your qubits in state zero. Um, so you see, you, you work directly uh, with the unitary operator. So you apply a, a, a matrix U. Uh, physicists, we are, as a physicist, we are used to working with energy, with Hamiltonian. Uh, so essentially, what this mathematician suppose is that you have, uh, you give yourself this U, and you, someone has worked out uh, what the Hamiltonian uh, is. And so it's, it's a very uh, core version of quantum mechanics, where you forget about uh, time, energy, no fermions, no bosons, no space, no, I mean, so it's really just a linear algebra. You are left with the bare minimum that you need to have something that you can call quantum mechanics. Uh, so you give yourself the different operations. For instance, you can apply Pauli matrices. These are unitary operations, like the sigma x uh, is going to flip uh, the state of a qubit. So you can call it a not operation if you are in the context of a uh, of computing, uh, the Z operation is going to put a phase minus one if you are in qubit one. H is called the Adamar. It's if you go, if you start from zero, you go to zero plus one. If you start from one, you go to zero minus one, and so on and so forth. You need at least one gate that entangles two qubits. Uh, the one I will use mostly today is a control knot. So if the qubit, the first qubit is in state zero, it does nothing on the second qubit. And if the first qubit is in state one, it flips the second qubit. Uh, and essentially, that's it. You know everything you need to know to start writing your uh, quantum algorithm. And you measure at the end. You measure at the end, and you get uh, zero or one with the probability that it's just the square of the wave function. Okay? Just to give you an example, for instance, if you do control not like this, a control not like that, and a control not like this, you can do the math. I mean, I'm not going to repeat them in front of you today, but if you start from a product state like this, you actually swap the two, uh, the two qubits. Uh, so this, is this, this gate is called the swap gate. And you can construct like this more complex operations. Uh, if you are interested, you can look at this website. Uh, it's kind of nice. We can actually draw your own circuit and it will do the computation for you about what it does. Okay, we know the rules. Uh, let's get to the core business. And uh, I have chosen to explain the, the core part of the show algorithm. Uh, and the reason I, I chose this one is because first, it's the most famous algorithm. Uh, also, it really contains all the elementary bricks that are involved almost everywhere in quantum computing. So show algorithm has been very important uh, from a sociological point of view, because if you can make it to work on a real quantum computer, it means that you can factorize big numbers into product. And if you can do that, you can break the RSA uh, protocols that we use for essentially all the things that start as HTTPS. Uh, so essentially, you can break the internet. You can spy on everyone, supposing that nobody knows that you have this. Otherwise, they might use another protocol. Um, so it's been very important. That's the core reason why the military started to found the quantum computing was really the show algorithm. It's really an algorithm where we believe strongly that the, the quantum computer is exponentially faster than the classical one. So it's a good incentive to, uh, uh, to try to build it. Uh, so there is a part of the short algorithm that I'm not going to explain. That's the mathematical part. So I'm just going to do the quantum computer part. And so you have to believe me that factorizing, uh, uh, factorizing a number is equivalent to finding the, the, the period of a function. So if you have a function f of x, 
uh, it's periodic, so f of a plus r is equal to f of a. And you want to find what is this period r. And if you can do that, then you can factorize big numbers. And this is just simple arithmetic, but it takes an hour or so to do it on the blackboard. Um, so on this, you see that if you have a classical computer, the only way, and you have a function that you can call, it's implemented by someone. On a, you can call this function, you want to find the period. You can't do much. I mean, you have to find f of x, f of x plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. If you find this, the same thing, then maybe you can check to see if it's really periodic. Uh, so you have to, to essentially try everything. Um, and here, essentially, the core is that we will be able to do that in just one call uh, to the function. So let me explain you how to do it. There are three, three steps. First step is very easy. Oops. Uh, so I start with all my qubits in state zero. I apply this Adamar gate on each qubit. So each qubit is going from zero to zero plus one. And then I end up with the sum of all possible states. It's this product of zero plus one times zero plus one times zero plus one, you expand it, you get all possible states. So by just doing this simple thing, I get the, the all possible input for my function. Great. Now I'm going to call my function, and then I will get in a single step, uh, all possible output or all possible input. See, this is quantum parallelism. Uh, so for that, I need to do uh, classical logic, right? I need to be able to do, uh, to do classical logic. And it's not so easy, actually, to do classical logic. So if I want, I have a, uh, a bunch of qubits, I want to do classical operation, but I, I get to f of this, where f is any function. So I want to do multiplication and addition, essentially. Uh, you realize that, for instance, if you have two qubits and you want to implement, uh, implement uh, the AND gate, well, you just cannot do it because it's, uh, this is, uh, you have less information here than there. And I, I, I want to do that by applying unitary matrix, so something which is, you can inverse. It's a, it's a unitary matrix. So I need it to be able to go back. So I need at least as much information at the end as at the beginning. So maybe you can try it, something like this, for instance. So as, then at least the output has as many variables as the input. But actually, this doesn't work either. If you can check, for instance, this doesn't work because zero and zero and one zero give the same result. So you, and actually, you can prove that this is not enough. You need a three qubit gate to be able to uh, to do classical logic. This one is called the Toffoli gate. Essentially, it's a control control knot. So it 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 moves uh, it moves uh, the the last qubit if both a and b are in a state of one. Uh, and for instance, you can check that if you do AB zero, you, go, you get AB on A and B. So that's okay, you, you manage to do classical logic. Uh, problem is that in nature, we don't have three qubit interaction. Mostly we have two qubit interaction. So you need to build this Toffoli gate from uh, two qubit gates. And it can be done. This is a circuit that will do it for you. But already you see that you, it's, it's kind of complicated. Huh? Just to, uh, to do this, you need uh, one, two, three, four, five, six control node. A bunch of TT is a rotation along the z axis of pi over eight. Uh, and actually, if you look at how it works, there is already interference. You manage to do some destructive interference for some paths, constructive from others, in order for all the end result to align uh, as you wish it. Uh, but in principle, you can implement it. And now, if you want to do, let's say, 3.5. Uh, that's a circuit uh, for 3.5. Uh, Thomas Eral gave it to me. Uh, it's supposed to be one of the best circuits, I mean, optimum in terms of number of gates. And you see each of these guys here is a control, control, something, not necessarily a control node, uh, which means that each of these guys, you need to expand into itself into uh, something pretty large. Um, so the bottom line is that no quantum computer at this stage can do something uh, as simple as 3.5. Because if you just look at how long this is, is and you just look at the typical fidelities we have, you just you just cannot do three dot five. It's just too complicated. Uh, I will yeah. Also one point. Um, okay, we come that come back to that when I explain quantum computer quantum career correction. Uh, actually, I've been showing this slide for quite a while. A couple of weeks ago, I I, I found actually someone who actually tried to do some logical uh, operation on the quantum computer. Uh, they, they use the ion Q, uh, uh, so it's ion, trapped ion, which are, they are slow qubits. They, we don't really know how we are supposed to scale that to bigger system. 
So it's, you can get up to 10 of them, but, but on the other hand, they are pretty much the best qubit on the market uh, at the moment. And they, did, they didn't try 3.5, they tried uh, one plus one. And this is the result of the experiment. You can get the stuff here. Uh, so you get essentially two 60% of the time. Uh, on the rest, okay, you can have a look and it's pretty consistent over different worlds. So this second part already is, you can feel that it's not going to be easy, this second part of the, but let's suppose that we have it working. Uh, so I can continue with my show algorithm. So I have a, a superposition of all input times what is going to be the output. Now I do classical logic and I'm going to have superposition of all the input times function of this input. Quantum parallelism, I have done in a single call to the F function, an exponential number of input has been calculated at the same time. Yet, at this stage, if you measure anything, if you start to, to measure your quantum bits, you're going to collapse your wave function. And so you're going to have just one value of A1, AN on F of A1, AN. So if you measure at this stage, you just get a single call and you're not even to get which one you get, you get three random input. So you get F of a random input, which is not terribly useful. So to do something useful, we need a third step, which is called quantum Fourier transform. And quantum Fourier transform, is a, 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 a huge interference experiment where we are going to have a constructive interference for the answer that we want and destructive interference for all the rest. So this is how it works. Quantum Fourier transform. Essentially, we are going to, uh, we want to, to, to implement something that takes a, a bunch of bits like that, a bunch of, of bits and goes to a sum of all the possibilities times the phase here where A is the integer that is written like that in binary form and C is this integral that is written like this in binary form. So you see, it looks a lot like a Fourier, fast Fourier transform. And you can write a circuit that is going to do this. Uh, and it looks like that. And you see you have pi over two uh, rotations, pi over four, pi over eight. Actually, you have pi over two to the power n. If you want to implement it, you need very, very precise correction. I mean, this the phase that you're going to, uh, the rotation that you're going to do is going to decrease uh, exponentially. So you need, uh, the more qubits you want, uh, the more precise you need to be if you want to, to get the correct result at the end. So if you have this, if you have implement, managed to implement that, uh, remember that we add at the previous step, a linear superposition of all the input times all the output. Now you do a quantum Fourier transform on the first of the input register here. So you just replace here this by the previous expression. Uh, and you can actually rewrite the fact that okay, now you use the fact that your function is actually periodic. So you can put together all the function value here that are the same. So uh, and if you do this mass, you will find that you get the exact same mass that you get when you, when you do a Fourier series. And, and uh, uh, you get the maximum amplitude here when QR is equal, when RC is equal to, to, uh, to two to the N on zero otherwise. So you have perfect constructive interference for the result that you are looking for on destructive interference otherwise. So you should get uh, with probability close to one, the period, uh, the input will be uh, for the period R that you are looking for. So in, in a single function call, you manage to find uh, this input. I mean, if you have done any inter interference experiment in your, in your life, you know that this is very sensitive. It's always really difficult to uh, tune something with two paths. Uh, here, you have to understand that you have an exponentially large number of paths. So it's not going to be easy to have this working, but nevertheless, on paper, at least it works. Uh, yeah, let me also state right away, it's, I think it's something important to try to understand the difference between quantum computers and classical ones. Uh, we are going to do a lot of calculation to get at the end one set of bits. So the, the quantity of information that you get out of quantum computer is very, very small in terms of rate of information. They are not going to deliver gigabyte or terabyte per second. It's more like you will see the, we, if it works, we might be in the micro byte per, per second or something like that. So this might be very important numbers. If you give you the, the winning uh, uh, stock you should invest on, maybe it's worth the calculation. But in terms of purely of information, we are going to get a few numbers. So that already limits the class of things that you might want to do with a quantum computer. 
And let me back, go back to the, this law that I, I stressed at the very beginning. If you put numbers here, uh, so typically, so this means that uh, F decreases exponentially. For the Shaw algorithm, you need n cube, um, you need n cube uh, classical operation to do this classical part, this classical logic part. This is really the bottleneck. Uh, a is just a number, I think the best value is 12. And epsilon is the error rate, so typically 1% for the best quantum computer. And so if you put this there and you try to see uh, for factorizing 15, what would be the probability of success, you get 10 to minus 4. Uh, so essentially, which means that you get a random result. You, get, uh, you try to factorize 15 and you get a random result. And that's weird because if you remember at the beginning of quantum computers, uh, one of the, the very symbolic things that uh, was in the market was that uh, it was an experiment by Van der Sippen using NMR. They managed to factorize 15. This is how actually everything started to be so important. And, and they, they uh, I think it's my next slide, they actually didn't do the classical part. They bypassed this part. So nobody so far has actually done the full show algorithm to factorize anything. And so they did demonstrate that uh, things work, quantum Fourier transform works, that, uh, I mean, but uh, they had to bypass the classical part because it, it would have taken far too many operations. They don't have, we don't have the fidelity to do this. Okay. Um, so that's essentially uh, already something. We understand what, what uh, our show works, how we're supposed to factorize big numbers. We understand that it's going to be tough on fidelity. Um, I'm going to discuss a bit uh, quantum error correction, which means how we are supposed to use this, okay, and I'm going to be very sketchy there because it, it, it takes a full hour just to explain quantum error correction correctly, but just to, to give you a glimpse of what it would take to implement quantum error correction, which means build logical states uh, that are very protected against decoherence, uh, that we can manipulate very precisely out of many physical ones. So the, the most uh, the most famous one is called the, 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 the surface code. It's actually a very clever device by, uh, invented by KTF. Uh, so you have to understand that here you have the qubits are the circles, the, the yellow circles. Uh, those are the, what the people call the data qubits. So essentially, the, this is the qubit that you will use for the quantum state of your quantum computer. And at the center of the Z and of the X, you have another qubit, which is called ANSIA, that is just used to. Uh, perform stabilization of the code. So what you are going to do is you're going to perform, so here, if I zoom on one of this uh, square here, for instance, this one, we are going to perform uh, over and over uh, this small circuit here. So we control, we do control node here on this on CR, and we measure the on CR state. That's very important. So we do a partial measurement, uh, not of the data qubit, because that would be collapsing the, the information, but of this on CR qubit, and that's going to suck entropy from the system and try to stabilize a state uh, which is more protected uh, against uh, decoherence and the bare physical uh, things we start with. And it's very clever. It, it, it has topology in it. If you, if you look at it, it's very close to Majorana fermions. Uh, that are also something that condensed matter physicists look around. Uh, it's, it's a very clever device. Um, and now, if you want to act on your logical qubit, uh, you need to do very complicated things. For instance, you need to do, do something called braiding. So to do a qubit, you will make a hole in your system, which means that you will not measure this on C as here. But I, I, don't, I don't even show them. And then if you move this all around, uh, this will be a logical operation uh, on uh, this qubit with that qubit. It's going to be a control dot. And moving around means uh, starting to measure this on CR, stopping to measure this on CR, and moving it little by little like that. Uh, so you, and, and you have to remember that each time you do that, you have to repeat again and again this uh, sequence here, on this small circuit. You also have to analyze the output of the measurement on your CR qubit. And depending on whether you find zero on one, which means whether an error happen or not, you have to take different decisions of what you are doing to do next. You need to get terabytes of data per second, so going terabytes for the smallest version. And you need to analyze and take the correct decision in real time. It's not finished yet. Uh, so if you put the whole thing together, I call that the Russell doll problem. Because whatever you want to do on a, a surface code, uh, you have to, to essentially uh, 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 
cut things into small pieces and each sub pieces is <laughs> contains sub pieces and then you have four level of small pieces like that. So if you have a, a quantum uh, uh, circuit like this, so the green, so each, uh, let's say each uh, green box is an operation on one qubit, one logical qubit. Uh, first, you have to break it into uh, universal gates. Uh, for instance, if you want to do pi over uh, two to the five, for instance, it's not in your box. So you have to find a combination of some universal gates uh, that uh, approximate what you want to do. And of course, this approximation, if you want it to be good, you need more and more of the blue boxes. Uh, then some of them here are called non-Clifford. I'm not going to explain the details, but it means that you have to prepare special states for that using something called magic state distillation that also use logical qubits. On this logical qubits here, whenever you see something like control dot, it means uh, layers like this, so long series of operations uh, on each of them. Again, it corresponds to measuring these uh, stabilizers again and again. So you see, you have a nested level of things. And if you put everything together, it's true that you get you have an, an exponential gain. So you go from something exponentially hard to something uh, polynomially hard, but uh, what people often don't tell you is what is the exponent of the polynomial, and it's actually fairly high. Uh, so in this uh, uh, in this uh, publication here, people looked at actually they, they try to put everything together. Uh, so typically, so it's it's a it's a benchmark for trying to do quantum chemistry for this molecule. Uh, it's really the smallest molecule where quantum computers could bring something. So 50 qubits, 50 logical qubits times two. You see, it takes 200 hours uh, to get one, uh, one set of 0 and 1. So after 200 hours, you get 50 bits. That's what I mean by, I say, uh, 8 micro octet per second in terms of information bandwidth. Uh, also, they assume very high, uh, essentially, they assume the fastest qubits that you can find on the market. Usually, there is always a trade off when a qubit is fast. Uh, it means that the coherence rate is not going not so good, or when you can scale them. I mean, essentially, all the qubits have the advantages of their disadvantages. If you want to know what is good in a qubit, you look at the corresponding paper. If you want to know what is bad, you look at the competition. They will tell you uh, what, the, what are the limitations. And, and there are, usually, there is no free meal. It's, it's some sort of, uh, of a trade-off. Uh, and if you look at the qubit count, here it's assuming, for instance, 10 to minus 6 error rate for the one for the one qubit, uh, which is far from where we are. We are more in the 10 to minus two at the moment, maybe three for the best cases. Uh, you need typically, uh, mostly due to this uh, so-called T-gate factory, you need billions of qubit. And so it's important to also to have this number of in, in mind. People often tell you, oh, you need thousand logical uh, physical qubit per logical one. And uh, it's also what you find here. But that means if only if you don't want to manipulate them. If you want to start manipulating, you need all these extra qubits around, uh, magic state distillation, and then the, the count it goes to, to billions, uh, even with very optimistic assumptions. And you have to scale up. I mean, you have to get this 10 to minus 6, not for one qubit, for, but for billions of them. So it's not clear how, of, how soon we are going to have this. Uh, uh, this quantum error correction working. And last time I was in a conference, uh, uh, even optimistic people, they say, uh, um, the answer is essentially, we get it after I retire. Uh, I'm just going to have a, like one side remark, uh, applied on quantum chemistry. Uh, so solving the many-body problem, I mean, I am slightly biased because if quantum computers manage to solve the many body problem, I am essentially out of job. Um, so it, that would be not so good for me. Uh, but like, uh, let's, let's suppose that, that, uh, that we manage to build a fault tolerant quantum computer and we want to do quantum chemistry so that we can find you know, new catalyzers for cracking the uh, nitrogen of the, of the air, for making fertilizers, or we are going to make new drugs, new. Uh, then essentially, what we are going to do is the following. Uh, we are going to prepare an approximate ground state. There are a lot of algorithms, quantum algorithms to do that. And then we are going to measure, uh, so essentially we can measure uh, so an algorithm called phase estimator. We are going to measure the uh, operator expo the expansion minus IHT. It's the same thing as measuring the Hamiltonian. 
which means that we are going to project phi onto a state, uh, and we, we want to do that until we find the ground state. And so the probability to get the ground state it's very simple. It's overlap between my ground state and, and the approximate state that I managed to build. Uh, but we have a problem here, and it's not in condensed matter as orthogonal catastrophe. Like we know that whatever you do, even if you do your best, this, this overlap decays exponentially with a number of, of qubits. That's you know, it's almost a law of nature. Uh, it's known in the, in the context of uh, X-ray singularity, but it's, it's more general than that. It's really a many body thing. On, on what this guy did here, he has a very nice uh, talk you can watch on YouTube. Uh, so Garnet Chan is a quantum chemist, and he measured this. He took the best quantum states in, in the new of, measured the overlap as a function of the number of okay, metal centers, so the number essentially of the size of the, of the molecule. And you do indeed find uh, an exponential decay. It means that you're going to have to repeat your experiment an exponentially, uh, exponentially large number of times before you actually finally get to the ground state. So it's not even clear that if we add this billion qubit, 10 to minus six working together, uh, we could solve the many body problem with it. I think it's, it's been, been a bit harsh to, uh, to, uh, to say that uh, too early. Um, now I'm going to talk a bit about what we could do. Okay, fault tolerant quantum computers, it's going to be hard, okay. Uh, but maybe we can do something with noisy one, the one that we have now. And so people have started to look at this. Uh, and here is an experiment by IBM. It's already a, a bit old, but uh, the recent ones are not so, so different. What you do is uh, you want to, to, okay, you want to, to do essentially variational Monte Carlo. You want to do, the, uh, you want to do a variational uh, calculation. So you create a variational and that's here, parameterized by some parameters. And this you create by just putting some uh, circuit where the, these pulses here depend on these parameters theta. Uh, and then you, uh, at the end, you measure uh, the average value of the energy. You measure your qubits, and you can measure different correlation functions. And you can, eventually, you can reconstruct the uh, average energy. Oops. Uh, and then you can optimize theta to get the lowest energy. And you have done a variational calculation with your quantum computer. OK? And you can optimize the optimization, of course, is classical. You just, uh, but okay. Still, maybe this is a useful thing that you can do. And this is what they got. You see, there is uh, energy versus uh, distance for uh, hydrogen atom. Here, it's a lithium hydrogen, or a slightly more complex uh, molecule, taking a very minimum basis set. Here, it's essentially two qubit. Here, you have four, and here, you have uh, six. Uh, so, this is called VQE, like Variational Quantum Eigen Solver been also discussed a lot. What you realize here is that the, you don't really have a good reason to believe that this is actually any, any faster than a classical one. I mean, there are no theoretical argument that I know of that really tells you that this is going to be faster. And if you look at the, there are papers showing that actually the optimization is NPR, classical part of the optimization is NPR. Uh, in practice, you have also, the optimization is very difficult because you get exponentially small gradients. So it's actually difficult to do the minimization. Uh, and I think for me, the, the most, uh, the most uh, severe critique that you can do about this is the fact that if you put numbers, uh, you realize that to do a variational calculation of any use, you need four to five digits precision. Uh, you, you need to four to five digits. If you look at these scales here, this curve looks pretty good, but we are in R3. So the R3 is 27 electron volt. And if you want to do chemistry, you want to be in the, let's say you want to have a precision of 30 Kelvin, let's say. You want to be smaller than room temperature. So you want 0 0.1 milliard tree precision. Uh, and just, just by the fact that, you are, that now your measurement is statistical, you have to repeat your, measure, your experiment over and over to, to diminish your error bar. You just have a one over square root convergence. This is really a stati usual statistical uh, error bar. So even if you had a perfect computer, the fact that you need to measure a lot uh, uh, is, is just in itself is enough to, to tell you that you will never get to these precisions. Right? So for chemistry, biology is even worse because biology, I mean, we all know that uh, when our body temperature rises by one degree, uh, I mean, it changes <laughs> quite a lot the way we feel. 
Uh, I took the example of superconductivity in aluminum. The condensation energy is 10 to minus 8 relative to the normal state. Uh, the precision, kind of precision that you, you want are actually very, very high. And, and that means that actually any classical algorithm, even a bad mean field, will give you something better than what you see on this plot. So, so quantum, uh, many body numerical people like, like I am are not very impressed when we see uh, something like this. Also, these circuits are very shallow. On, uh, on this is our shallow circuit or something we know very well how to, to simulate. Okay. And in the limited time that I have left, I will tell you a little bit about my own work, uh, very, very briefly. Um, so uh, on, on this quantum supremacy claim. So if you read the, the abstract of this quantum supremacy paper by Google, uh, they essentially claim that they did something that would take 10,000 of years on the largest uh, supercomputer on Earth. It would take 10,000 of years to, to do something similar. Uh, so first, it's, it's not true. It's because the algorithm they were using was a bit lame. And later, it has been improved. And now people did it in 300 seconds. So that's nine orders of magnitude faster, which means that they, they, they were not very careful in their initial claim. Nevertheless, it's, it's very hard what they did because in the sense that these 300 seconds, it was done using 40 million cores. It was done on a, a Alibaba uh, superconducting, supercomputer cloud. Uh, so if you in terms of computing hours, that's still a lot. Uh, so I'm going to take to tell you a bit my take on this uh, as a simulation uh, guy. On, on my take, I mean, uh, you should be able to, to, uh, to have an idea from what I said earlier, uh, was to, to use the fact that, okay, uh, maybe it takes a while if you want to get the exact state, because the, yes, the space is exponentially hard, is a large, it's exponentially hard problem, that's true. But uh, as I showed earlier, the, the, they found a fidelity that was actually decaying exponentially. And in the supremacy point, supremacy point, actually, where they do not show you any data, uh, they just extrapolation, they did an experiment, but they cannot show you anything. It's, it's an experiment which is not super interesting in itself. It's just for the sake of producing a state uh, that you cannot really uh, simulate experimentally. At this point, they had a, a fidelity 10 to minus 3. Uh, and so I said, okay, maybe we can switch. We can try other many body techniques. We can try many body techniques that actually do uh, compression that are not exact, approximate. And maybe, uh, maybe that will make the computation much simpler. Okay, so this is what we did. Uh, I'm a bit out of time, so I will, switch. I will skip the mass. We'll just give you the, the, the rough ID. Uh, so essentially, we have a many body state. Where we make drawings like that. Everything is based on tensor networks, matrix product state. For those who know, it's essentially what we did was to borrow DMRG, TEBD techniques that are very useful for uh, uh, many body physics. Uh, we just borrowed and transformed them to make them applicable to, uh, to quantum circuit. Uh, and this idea of these uh, techniques is to do compression. Compression in the same sense that you would comp do a compression of a JPEG image uh, of a cat or a dog like this. Right? You, if you take an image, if you just need to store each pixel of the image, it would take you know, 100 megabytes, and you know that you can have super nice uh, images for a, a small fraction of that. And you can do that because you, you use something. You use the fact that if you take an image with your camera, it's not a random image. If you take a random image, it looks like this. And if you, if you, if you take many, many random images, you can take billions of them, they will always look like this. The probability that it looks like something you are used to is zero. Never happens. Just never. Even remotely, something that if you look at the clouds, sometimes it you know, reminds you, oh, this looks like a deer, or, but a random image, never. And that means that the, the fraction of the images that we see in our day-to-day -day life is a tiny fraction of the possible images, and this is what we use to do compression. And so we do the same uh, with many body techniques. We, we use the fact that real states are, are actually structured, that they have some meaning, they have a, and so because of that, they can, they can be compressed. In terms of these techniques, it's really based on the limited entanglement that you can have into different parts of your system. So the fact that you don't have everybody entangled to everybody in a, in a, in a, in a, in a laboratory way, but only, only a fraction of that. And, and uh, so we apply these techniques. 
on, 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 I have to stress that the, the quantum supremacy experiment of Google has been done exactly for to, to, so that the state they have looks the most like this. They did their best to have the, the thing the most difficult to compress as possible. It's probably the most difficult thing that you could, uh, uh, that you could uh, build. And, and let just me show you the, the final result. So this is the error that we get uh, as a function of the parameters that essentially control the, the compression. So the higher it is, the, the more computing time we need, but, but the less, the more precise as a result. And we have different techniques and I'm not going to enter into the details, but the point is that here we have two points here that are inside this gray zone, which means that we are capable of producing, uh, of producing uh, bit strings uh, with the same quality as Google on, on the laptop, uh, not on the 40 million uh, 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 cores. So it's uh, just because we do something much simpler, because they did something much simpler, they didn't produce perfect bit strings, they produced bit strings that are actually relatively low fidelity, uh, only 0.1%. Uh, overlap with what they should get. And, and the advantage of this compression technique is that if we can do it for 50 qubits, you can do it for 200. So actually, the, the, the real curve is this. It's even easier for, for even easier for, for many of them because then if you want to stay at fide constant fidelity, you have to, to get to, to limit the depth that make it easier for us. But okay, whatever the two curves you switch, uh, it means, and that means that it, there is no way you can beat a classical computer by just increasing the number of qubits. What you need to do is to increase the fidelity. In some sense, simulation, classical simulation of quantum computer is always exponentially difficult. Usual people, they, they, they started something exponentially hard in the number of qubits or in the depth. What we chose is something exponentially hard in the error rate, something that we can more compare with experiments. And so you need definitely, that's going to be maybe the main message of this talk, if you want to build a quantum computer that does something really useful, the fidelity needs to improve on quite, quite drastically. On my last slide uh, is uh, we did the same, but not for the supremacy experiment. We did the same now for a circuit that is supposed to uh, do something useful. It's called QAOA for those that uh, know it. It's, it's essentially, uh, it's supposed to do, it's another of this super useful algorithm. It's supposed to do uh, combinatorial optimization. So solve uh, Trailman, uh, the, the, the max cut problems, so essentially for, for physicists, find the minimum of a complex Ising model. Uh, and apparently this is useful for industries that you can you know, optimize some uh, trajectories or, or things like that. And when you do that, you use an algorithm that is much more structured than the random one. So this is uh, what we get for the supremacy sequence. So then we get you know, 6% error, pretty bad in this, uh, in this simulation mode. And when I use uh, the QAOA, now I am 99.99 uh, 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 fidelity. So I get something which is now much, much better than the, than the experiment. So it means that for, uh, for the same number of qubits, 54, on the same number of uh, two qubit gates. So it's really, you can really compare the circuit this one is very highly structured and therefore easier for us. While experimentally, it's not easier. It's actually slightly harder to do this thing with, uh, uh, with experiments. And I will stop with this. So I have a list of uh, all the messages I, I, I have today. I mean, you can read it. Essentially, I'm just not going to repeat myself. And uh, we still have uh, five more minutes left if you guys have some questions uh, for me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Xavier, for the very interesting uh, talk. Uh, so for all, all the people on Zoom, please uh, use the question and answer box to ask your questions. We shall come to your questions. Uh, maybe we uh, start nevertheless with questions from the audience in the room uh, who like to start. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, please uh, use the microphone, otherwise the people on Zoom will not hear you. Thank you for the nice presentation. So for an experimentalist, what does the fidelity means? For example, if I have a material with say graphene and I put some spin on it by some transition metal, what does the fidelity means? 
Uh, it's, so to get to the point where you can measure a fidelity, you already need to go through many steps. It's, you know, you are far past the material. You need to, uh, to okay, you have a material, and then you make a device, let's say a quantum dot to confine one electron. Then you start to put some uh, lines to send voltage of magnetic field. Uh, then you need to wait to measure the state of your qubit. So maybe you want to untangle it with something else. You have a detector somewhere. Uh, and when you have all these things ready, you can send the pulse, let's say, that is supposed to do, uh, let's say, a pi rotation. And then you number, you, you count the number of times you get one when you measure your, 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 your qubit. And, and this, that's essentially your fidelity. But, uh, so it's, it's, you should get 100% of one. And if you get 95%, of one, you get 95% fidelity, which sounds good, but it's actually pretty bad. It's a time time factor. It's kind of relaxation. So it's, no, 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 no. It's the fidelity englobes everything. It's like a, you have many things fighting against you. You have T1, T2s, like decoherence rate. And then, but it also encompass how, how precise you are able to do your pulse. Uh, how, I mean, uh, how you are handling the idle times when you do nothing, because you know that your spin is going to process, and you know you need to track down exactly how much it is it's going to be, because when you apply the next pulse, if you apply it a bit too early or too late, it's going to be bad too. So it's not about physics, it's about engineering. It's like you have to put everything together on, on the fidelity uh, is, uh, is the number of specification you get at the end. Yeah. Other questions? I, I had one. Yes, please. I, I'm a computer guy, so I, I'm, I'm interested. I mean, from a practical point of view, I, I read that many HPC centers now have their own, are, are going to go into quantum computing in 2023 and so on. Will they have a physical machine, you think, a real computer where they can uh, submit jobs or programs? Or? Yeah, so you, you at this stage, what you can find, uh, essentially what people have been able to, to build, on, on very based on very difficult physics principle, but the part I didn't explain, are essentially systems of a few, uh, typically five to 10, uh, the best can go to 15, 20. Google has one chip with 53. Uh, even though if you look at all the experiments they did, is for more, like, they use only 10 or 15 of these qubits because they don't have the fidelity to use more. So essentially people manage to, to build small system with let's say 10 to 20 qubits, uh, where you have an error rate of typically 1%. If we time you do something, you lose 1%, which means after you have done 100 uh, something, you are, <laughs> you are in the dark. Uh, and so these things then either they, they keep it for themselves or they can try to sell them, or some people put them on the web, uh, like IBM, for instance, you can come up with your own quantum circuit, uh, you submit it online and then it goes to the machine, uh, so somewhere it goes to a cryostat where there are uh, the superconducting circuits. So we send, a, and then you get the answer back. Uh, and you can also buy some. So there are many business models. And yes, it's true. HPC Center wants to buy those because they want to be uh, quantum ready, as they say. Uh, okay. You, well, at this stage, we are, I would say, from my point of view, we are still in a stage where people are essentially doing experiments on rather complex experiment systems. <laughs> Do you have one here in, uh, at CEA? Yeah, you have one here. So CEA, as a, they want to, so CEA is building one with silicon, uh, but they are yet to demonstrate entanglement. They are more at the one qubit stage at the moment. Uh, and they want to, HPC center at CEA wants to buy one, most probably it's going to be one of the Rydberg atoms because we are good with Rydberg atoms in France. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe another one from superconducting circuit. I, I don't know exactly what they are going to buy, but yes, they are going to present something eventually. Mm. Yeah, More I'm questions from the room? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, yeah, so, so, yeah. I, I'm an experimentalist as well, so this was a really nice uh, theoretical overview and introduction into the problems of uh, quantum computing. And you mentioned the systems, I'm not familiar with it, so you mentioned both Einstein condensates and spins. What are practical machines or setups you have nowadays or people have nowadays in the world? So once again, very different uh, communities. So people from atomic physics, uh, they are building things. So with uh, uh, cold ions, so you know that you, you can cool down with uh, lasers and then the, the, those ions you can actually 
confine them with electric field. Uh, cold atoms also people are now with atoms, but with Rydberg atoms, so you excite them with microwaves and you get them big, close to the ionization uh, rate, and you can manipulate them there. Uh, so that's the uh, atomic physics part, and op quantum optics part are, are also trying to build things, either on chip or on optical tables. Um, uh, in condensed matter, which is a mainstream approach, is using superconductors, I and mean, superconductors are quantum, macroscopic quantum states, so it's a natural idea to use them. So this is, for instance, Google is using them, IBM is using them. Actually, all the Principles were actually done in France, mostly in, a, in, in the group of Devore and Estève in, uh, in Saclay. Uh, so these are, then you go to a clean room and you just deposit aluminum and you make uh, aluminum oxide. And then you have your system that you cool down in the relation fridge to 10 millik. You can do the same also with semiconductors. And that's not as advanced as the superconductors part, but people are trying to, to see where, how far they can go. You can, anything you, you can think of is a qubit. So this is why all different so communities any, are competing any, for, for different platforms. Yeah. Any quantum state somehow. I mean, you need to, if you look at the zoology of qubits that you can find, um, the best ones are the ones that are mostly isolated from the rest of the world. They have super good uh, coherence times. They can stay coherent forever or almost. But of course, this one, it means that they don't interact with the rest of the world. So it's a pain in the neck to actually manipulate them. That's where the efficiency is also. And that's right. So you have to find a compromise on, you want to have something where you can couple it, not too much. Maybe you can couple it when you need it and then uncouple it when you don't. So that you can, so people are trying to find the best compromise to, to build this thing. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, someone online asked uh, whether the talk will be available for replay and the answer is yes, it will be available for replay on the YouTube channel of ESRF. Uh, we have a question uh, on Zoom from Olivier Stéphane Rubo who asks, well, uh, for tolerant is not for tomorrow if one uses the surface code, but what about others that require a few qubits? I have in mind molecules with multiple spin qubits say three or five, in which one is the error corrected qubit and the molecule runs the error connection code. Uh, not sure whether. No, but I mean, w whenever I give a talk like this, I mean, I'm a very skeptical guy. I mean, so uh, there are many people that are much more optimistic than I do, and they always uh, always come up with something that I am not aware of. I mean, not always, but it, it happens. And then every time I come back home and I look at, okay, what is this new thing? There is always a catch. I mean, there is no miracle. I mean, if you want, if you look at the precision you need to do uh, sh uh, shore, for instance, for something useful, you need to manipulate your quantum state with precisions in the 10 to minus 15 range. You need to do rotations to do, I mean, everything has to be in the 10 to minus 15. Uh, you can bring that down maybe to a little bit less precise, but these are precisions that are methodological precisions. I mean, we are, I mean, I know only of a very few experiments in physics where we have reached 10 digits or 12 digits, a couple, you know, but very, very few. Um, so there is no magic. I mean, quantum error correction is not going to save everything. I mean, I, I wrote a paper on that actually. And, and if you look at the, the it's metrology, so you quantum error correction might help you a little bit, uh, either, either surface code or other codes. Or, so you will gain, maybe you will get something better, and then you will find an error which is actually not corrected by your code, and then you will have to hunt it down and to find a new code that corrects it, and, and then you're going to advance step by step uh, on how far we are going to go in practice, whether the government is going to fund us before, until we get to the 10 to minus 15, which is just the beginning, and 10 to minus 15 is not where you want to be. It's really where you start to believe that you will be in a stage where really you can do things that a classical simulation won't be able to do. So at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's, it's impossible to prove that it will not work. I mean, mass are, the mass are sound, there are no problem with the mass. Uh, but uh, the estimation that we can do at this stage are not very favorable. So a question from myself. So do you still trust the RSA encryption? And for how long do you think you should you might trust it? Yeah, I think you're safe. <laughs> for a while. For a while. <laughs>
Any other question from the audience in the room? I see no, also no questions on, on Zoom. So no, yes, please go ahead. So thank you very much for this nice talk. Uh, so you, you showed that uh, you could, uh, okay, try to simulate uh, the, the Google experiment uh, using uh, content compression, if I understood correctly. Uh, my question is, could you do like, uh, take the, the problem uh, the other way around, like using quantum compression to try to simulate a, a real quantum um, thing. Uh, because uh, I mean, in real life, uh, your system is uh, coupled to your environment. So it's uh, also, it could be uh, subject to decoherence. Uh, can you use this uh, method to uh, simulate the uh, accuracy? Yes. Uh, real system? Yes, actually this is our day-to-day -day life is to simulate quant that would be a, would have been a physics talk which which would have defeated the purpose of this one which would be the point of view of the mathematicians uh, but yes on the day-to-day -day life uh, we simulate many modif equations Lindblad equation to try to see uh, how, how I mean essentially whether the quantum state that are built in the lab correspond to what we what they should be essentially because at, at the moment what we are doing is essentially characterize quantum physics, characterize the quantum state and see whether we can build entanglement. Can we make sure that entanglement is there? How much decoherence we have, which means entanglement with things that we don't control. And, and all these things are what happened in the physics side. Essentially theorists on the physics side are doing that exactly. Yeah. So, so the question is maybe we don't really need a quantum computer to simulate uh, uh, quantum systems, maybe Using, uh, your, your so uh, up to up to 30 qubits, clearly we, we don't because by, just by doing brute force simulations, we can just simulate anything we want. Uh, beyond that, uh, then essentially the, you cannot do brute force, you have to be smart. So either you do compression like I did, or we have many other ideas and it doesn't have to be compression with respect to the entanglement. There are many, many ideas, but you have to leverage on something. Uh, you can do, not solve the brute force equation. Brute force is, a, is an EDP with so many degrees of freedom, it's never going to hold in any computer. So you have to find some structure, something that you can exploit to be able to simulate. And in that sense, uh, if, if people manage to make a real quantum computer, super precise and so on, uh, at some point, they will be able to reach a point in the Hilbert space uh, that don't have this structure and, or that we won't be able to simulate. And, and it might be useful. Um, <clears throat> oh, yes, please, Jakub. Yeah. Thanks for a very nice talk. It's for me, it's a new thing, uh, quite new thing. So I have a question. So if now I'm about to decide what direction is better to develop quantum computers, so it is from now math perspective. So if if I would go and uh, make the metrology better to work on the fidelity or make the algorithms which do the, the, the error, uh, uh, let's say, correction better, right? Because for the error correction, you need lots of qubits, so it's unrealistic. But for the, uh, for the, <clears throat> for the let's say, increasing the, the metrology, making it better, you need you need just better devices. And so, so you work on the fidelity. So is there mathematical prediction that let's say you can do good uh, error correction with very few qubits? Um, okay, so the short answer is that you, you have to work on both. <laughs> uh, no, so there, are, there is something called uh, threshold theorems. And it's something very dangerous. So is that you give me a good opportunity to, uh, to discuss it. So very often in the experimental paper, you see at the beginning, we are close to threshold, or, or that's it, we are beyond threshold. And there is this idea that if you, because the, the quantum error correction, they only work if you are, if your qubit, your initial qubit is already better than the threshold. If, you, if beyond, beyond this threshold, you, you get things worse. It's easy to think about it. You, you get an idea to, so you, you, you use many qubits. If they are very bad, you have more chances <laughs> for things to be, to get, you know, more places where things could go bad. So there is this threshold. And so there is this idea that, okay, once we get above threshold, you get an exponential uh, improvement of the fidelity. 
as a number of the physical qubit per logical one. Okay, so you, uh, and, and, and it's really the ratio of, of the fidelity you have divided by the threshold that gives you this the prefactor of the exponential. Uh, and, and one has to be very careful because if you, if you know the quantum error correction theory a little bit better, you realize that any quantum uh, error correction scheme only corrects for a set of errors. So you only gain for those errors. But those errors are not the physical ones. Physical, uh, many of the, uh, all, I mean, if you look at the physical errors, the one that will happen, uh, they are essentially, they are corrected, correctable errors or non correctable errors. On the non correctable errors, for instance, at the moment, there are two orders of magnitude lower than the correctable ones. Typically for the superconducting circuit, they are in the 10 to minus four, on the correctable ones and the 10 to minus two, one, 1%, 0 0.01%, which means that if we manage to add qubits with lower than the threshold, uh, on, on surface code is the best way for that because it, it has the, the easiest threshold, then we could gain until we reach the, the non-correctable error, which happened to be a leakage, for instance, in this case. The fact that uh, you, you actually use, uh, you have a zero and one, but actually in the physical system, there is also two, three, four, and sometimes you go where you didn't want to go. In, in theory, you can say, okay, you can manage to make a new surface code that actually will take care of this leakage. Uh, but of course, you will lose somewhere. You will have more operations, more on CR qubits, and so the, the threshold will get higher. And so and then you have to start again. And also you will have to find these non-correctable errors. And it's going to be difficult because as I said, you will have terabytes of information coming uh, per seconds. And you will have to locate very, very small, I mean, very, very unlikely event. Uh, so, but okay, in principle it's possible, but you, so you, you need better qubit anyway. So at this moment we are, not above threshold anyway. So quantum error correction is, let's say it's in the gray zone where it maybe give you, so it doesn't give you anything really, really significant. You have to improve there. And, and then you, you will have to, I mean, you have to improve everywhere. Um, I have one more question. For classical computers, we have the Moore's law, uh, which says that essentially some of the performances increase exponentially with time. And do we have any similar law for uh, quantum computers? How fast do performance improve? And observe. Is it you mean what we observe? No, I would say at the moment what we observe is when you have one qubit, quickly, a couple of years later, you get two qubits. And then people start to struggle to get four working. And then to get 50, 50 qubits working, which was what uh, Google did, it was already a tremendous effort. It, it, I would say it, it looks more... The, uh, I, I, I have the feeling that it's exponentially hard to scale. It, it's clear that it's exponentially hard in the sense that if you, I mean, if you make one device and it has a probability 90% of working, then if you need 10 devices like that to work together, then you get the probability that everything works is 0 0.9 to the power 10. Uh, so there is clearly, you know, the yield per device must be already really good, but then also you need to understand all the interaction between the device. You have all kinds of problems of, for instance, all these condensed matter things use uh, electrostatics, so you, you have a, a cross capacitance, and so you have to control everything. You need to control everything. And the more qubit you have, the more you need to control because uh, the more operation you will need to do to be able to use them, and therefore the more precision you, you, you request. Yeah, but okay, but if the progress of quantum computer technology is not fast enough, it will never catch up against. Uh, more slow for classical computers. Of course, more slow will not more, last forever. More slow is looking, it's looking, uh, is flattening, but still, <laughs> but, but still not. Uh, no, so experimentally, not experimentally in quantum computers, at the moment, we are we don't have a, a more low. We don't even know yet which is the best platform. Everybody is trying in parallel. And uh, on, as I said, some people have advantages for something, other for other things. Uh, it's I would say. Essentially, everybody is doing fundamental research, pretending to, to do uh, industrial work. But uh, when it's, what is really happening is that we are discovering, as we do, what is happening there. Okay. Any more questions from the, from the room or from Zoom? No, it seems no. Uh,
Okay, so uh, let's uh, thank Xavier again. And for the people uh, on Zoom, uh, thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, hope we hope you join us uh, for our next event uh, soon. Uh, so have a nice weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.